So okay, these ladies, these two girls, Phoebe mm-hmm. Plummer and Anne, Anna Holland, chose to protest in their own way. And they are part of the the Just Oil Activist. And they threw soup all over Van Gogh's iconic sunflower painting. And they glued themselves to the wall. And they're out of UK. And this was a trending topic all over the place. People were talking about it. There we go. We have them on. And I simply want to know what they're protesting. And I want to give them the eyeball to share with us what they were really protesting. So if we have you on... uh, 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 Phoebe, is that you or are you Anna? I'm sorry if I don't know the two names. Hi, this is Anna. Anna, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Very good. First of all, thank you for uh, agreeing to do this and being on. We were trying to do it, I think, last week. Something happened. Uh, sometime we had it like three, four days ago, and then we uh, ended up doing it today. So if you don't mind, take a quick moment. What I just set it up as yourself and your friend Phoebe, you guys are part of the jo- Just Oil activists. You two chose to throw, uh, throw soup all over Van Gogh's iconic sunflower painting, and you glued yourself to the wall. Can you can you share with us what point you were trying to make? Yeah, absolutely. So in Just Stop Oil, our demands are that the government should end all new fossil fuel licenses. So currently trying to push forward 100 new fossil fuel licenses, which will, without a doubt, kill us. It's a genocidal policy that they're trying to push forward. So in Just Stop Oil, we are trying to prevent that from happening. We're trying to save not just ourselves, but our children and our families. So we decided to throw soup over Van Gogh's painting as a way not just to make a statement about that and to get a people finally talking about this climate crisis, but also to get people talking about the cost of living crisis, which is fueled by the same people who are pushing forward this climate crisis. Well, you, you, listen, wh- whether you're getting criticized for your approach or not, you got eyeballs and you got attention. So what you were trying to get accomplished, you got it. And people uh, paid attention to what you're what you're doing but now you said your concern is that this could kill us this could get pretty ugly can you unpack that a little bit for us on your argument yeah um you know so the science is clear since the first cop conference 26 years ago we have created more emissions than the entire of humanity up until that point right now it is a matter of political will in needing to change this rather than the science not being there. You know, this summer in the UK in the heat wave, we lost a third of our wheat crops. We're set to lose half of our potato crops. We're heading towards mass famine. Right now, 33 million people are displaced by floods in Pakistan. 36 million people are facing severe famine in East Africa right now. The climate crisis isn't a problem of the future. We're seeing the catastrophic effects of it right now. Can I ask you what grade are you guys in high school or in college? And um, we're both university students. Okay. Yes, I'm twenty. Phoebe's twenty-one. I, listen, please take that as a compliment that you look young. Don't don't take it by anything. It's just you look like you could be high school or college. So, it, it, what, at what point did the climate crisis become a concern of yours? Do you remember how old you were when the climate crisis became a concern of yours? And what was the setting when you sat there and said? you know, we better start paying attention to this. Was it early in high school? Was it in junior high school? Or is this a recent thing? Well, I personally began paying a lot more attention to not just the climate crisis, but the, the political climate in the world around me. It's around age 14 um, when I really started gaining an understanding of all the news headlines uh, that were coming through. And from that point, it just seemed that every single year, things got worse and worse and scarier and scarier. So in 2018, I started finally trying to do something about that. So 2018 is when Extinction Rebellion really became popular in the UK. And that's when I started getting involved in marches, in petitions, in writing letters to my uh, member of parliament. But then I realised that none of that made a difference. No matter how many marches I went on or how many petitions I signed, there was no actual change happening. You know, a petition could be signed by millions of people. It gets sent to Parliament, the House of Commons. They debate it, throw it away, and are done by their lunch break. You know, those methods didn't work, and it was so frustrating. So I joined Just Stop Oil because we are a peaceful protest group who use methods of civil disobedience and nonviolent direct action to actually make change happen. 
And it really feels that since I started taking action with Just Stop Oil, but finally what we're doing is making a difference. Yeah, I think for me, I um, I became aware of it. It sounds a funny thing because I think now we all are quite aware of the climate crisis or to some extent, but I became aware of it probably around five years ago. And at first, I think I only connected with it intellectually. You know, you look at these science and the facts and these predictions and it's easy to connect with it intellectually it's you can understand it but i'd ask anyone listening to this right now to connect with it emotionally because for me that that's when i knew i had to do something about it because as a young person i'm terrified about the future we're facing are you really are you really though are you really terrified are you really uh uh concern uh, for your life are you you know afraid of what's really going to happen and if yes what do you think really will happen like how what how bad do you think it's going to get if your concern is truly climate change that this thing's going to change how bad do you think things are going to be because AOC said we, we may be you know ceasing to exist in 12 years and I'm sure you guys have seen that when she said that a couple of years ago and, you know, Greta, you know, Thunberg has gone around talking about how she called them, uh, uh, called out a lot of different political leaders around the world for not doing anything. And she went out there and she got noticed by a lot of different people. Are you truly concerned about your future when it comes down to climate change? Yeah, I really am. Last and- year, Sir David King, who was the uh, former chief scientific advisor yeah. in the UK, said what we do in the next three to four years will determine the future of humanity. Because there's these tipping points that scientists warn us of, which when you surpass them, you've done irreversible harm. It doesn't matter the kind of policy changes we make or the sustainable changes we make. Once you surpass those tipping points, irreversible harm has been done. So as a young person, I'm terrified I'm going to be denied the right to grow old. I'm terrified I'm going to live in constant fear of climate disaster. I'm terrified that I won't have access to clean water or food. And we know that these fears are real because right now millions in the global south are living the realities of these fears. And they're the people that have done the least to cause the climate crisis. So what do you what do you yeah. think? What do you think about and, and I'm listen, I'm not in this space. Neither are you guys. This is something you're protesting. I have my own things. I protest. That's important to me. You know, we all have lived our lives and I have to, we have to respect everyone's concerns, fears and passions that they have in their lives. But what, what do you think about rich uh, people who work for these large insurance companies? Do you think they like losing money? Can you guys hear well, I don't me or no? Any, I don't think anyone likes using money. That's why we have to use disruptive tactics. And, you know, in the UK right now, we are entering an awful cost of living crisis. Right. Yeah, earlier right. this year, the head of British Petroleum, one of the biggest oil companies in the UK, said he has more money than he knows what to do with. He has the audacity to say that. When our country is plunged into this cost of living crisis, yeah. where this winter families are going to be forced to choose between heating and eating, parents are starving themselves so that they can feed their children. And the head of this massive oil company says he has more money than he knows what to do with. Yeah. So, but let me let me give you an idea where I was going with this question on what I, what what's the one data that gets uh, this argument to be done with is a lot of these actuaries in the insurance industry, their job is to underwrite the billions of dollars that they're sitting on to protect it. Like their job is to manage risk. That's what they get paid to do. They go to universities, they come out, and they're supposed to study every single thing. And then this insurance company is sitting on, say, $50 billion, $20 billion, and you're coming and saying, I want to get XYZ insurance 30 years from now, 20 years from now. Insurance, cost of insurance is going lower, life insurance, different kinds of insurance that's going lower because people are thinking we're going to live longer. Life expectancy has gone higher in many different countries in the world. And the only reason actuaries are charging life insurance to be so cheap is because they're thinking we're going to live to 100. Like odds are right now, Phoebe, and I'm a little concerned for you guys. You guys are two young, healthy, attractive girls. You're probably going to live to 100. It's all going to be all right for you to be afraid of the fact that the end of the world is coming kind of uh, uh, prevents you some of your best years of your life to enjoy yourself. Now, 
don't get me wrong, I love the fact that you have a passion, but what do you think about these actuaries and these billion-dollar insurance companies that when they do the math, they sit there and say, you're probably going to live to 100 years old, and if that's the case, that means maybe AOC and Greta are wrong. What do you think about these guys that went to school and they do math all day, just a boring life, and they try to protect the billions of dollars of these insurance companies? Okay, so this year, we had the worst droughts in 500 years. That destroyed a third of our wheat crop, half of our potato crop. In the UK, we uh, this summer, we reached 40-degree heat, which is something that was not predicted to happen by scientists until 2050. In those just 48 hours of 40-degree yeah. heat, 1,700 people died of heat exhaustion. The NHS ambulances were put on black alert. Fire brigades had their busiest day since the blitz. You know, we're not worried about our future because we don't have a future to be worried about. This climate crisis is happening right now. We got so lucky that this summer, that heat only lasted 48 hours. Next summer, it's going to last even longer. Next summer, even more people are going to die. But no, let's look sooner than this summer, okay? Let's look at this winter, just a few months. Two thirds of UK families are going to be forced into fuel poverty. You know, children are going to freeze to death in their own homes because our government are too lazy and too incompetent and too downright abusive to care about us. We're not fighting for some distant future. We can't afford to think that far ahead. I don't care about life insurance because I'm not going to live long enough to cash it in. Oh, you know, I, I, I understand I what you're saying. To, yeah. All I'm, I'm about optimistic. I just want to get to 25. That's my only goal right now. You know, it, it's, it's, I understand what you're saying, and I, I respect your passion, and it's obvious it's very sincere, and you're, you're, you're truly concerned about this. Uh, but I will tell you, to me, a lot of time when you, when you look at these greedy people, the good thing about greedy people is, you know, if their life revolves around money. So let's, you know, the person you guys were talking about earlier that he says, I have so much money, I can't even count. So let's, let's judge those greedy people. The benefit about greedy people is they're, 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 it's a very honest relationship. What matters to them is protecting their money and not risk losing their money, right? They're not willing to risk all the money that they've made. And if insurance companies are still giving insurance policies to people thinking you're going to live another 80 years, that means that future is bright. But, you know, the, the part of protesting for you and for you to do what you do, super necessary. Go make your case. People are going to debate you. They're going to argue with you. I remember when Al Gore 30 years ago said we're supposed to be dead today. You know, in Al Gore's documentary, when he came up and he said, I don't know what it was, 25 years ago or 30 years ago, and a lot of people sat there and said, what happened? Your argument just didn't have any credibility. But it got a lot of young people to go out there and march and protest and get excited about it. So it's a very effective message. You Say you that again. You are already dead because of the climate crisis. I'm not right. saying that 10 years down the line, people are going to die. People are dying now, right now, because of the climate crisis. Right. Right. Well, go ahead, Katie. So yesterday, a lady that was involved in a car crash actually linked to one of my circle of friends. She died because an ambulance couldn't get through because your protesters just stop oil were blocking the road and the ambulance couldn't get through in time. She couldn't get the help she needed and she died. Earlier, you said that you are a peaceful protesters. My friend is dead. How do you answer that? We have a um, we have a blue light policy, um, which means whenever we have roadblocks, as soon as we um, hear sirens, we see the blue lights, people move out of the way. Even when people are gluing in the road, there's always one lane that is kept um, clear so that people can move out of the way. And we have never had any complaints from either ambulances, fire brigade or any other emergency services. The, to video, us the video footage exists and the lady can't complain now because she's dead. Let me ask you another question, Phoebe. Uh, let me ask you, what bills do you currently pay? Who pays for your accommodation at university? My student loan. When, have you ever paid any bills in your lifetime? No. So you don't know what it's like to be a homeowner and not to be able to afford your energy bills and then see some stupid young people throwing soup over a painting in a gallery that has nothing to do with the fact they can't afford to pay their bills. You don't know what it's like to pay a bill, Phoebe, do you? No, but I have empathy for those people. You know, this the climate crisis is fueled. 
but the cost of living crisis is fueled by the cost of oil crisis. They are both one crisis. It's a crisis of greed of our government and their billionaire friends. What do you understand about an ordinary family who can't afford to pay their fuel bills, who needs ordinary fuel to be delivered, but because of green taxation, their bills are now so expensive they can't afford them? And if we stop oil, how much more expensive do you think fuel is going to be, Phoebe? Or is it that you're just spouting out words that you and your friend think look good? How is it related to stopping oil to throw soup over a painting in a gallery? How is that related? How is it helping the poorest people in my country? I understand that right now fossil fuels are subsidised 32 times more than renewables, even though renewables are nine times cheaper. Would you rather your bills were £3,500 or £400? I would rather that you and your friends stopped wreaking havoc in the City of London. I'd rather you stop throwing soup over paintings, stop putting... Uh, orange paint on the windows of Harrods, stop sitting in roads so that my friend couldn't get the treatment that she needed. And I'd rather you went out, worked a bit. Maybe you could do some litter picking on a beach. Maybe you could do something that was practical and helpful. But I don't think being obtrusive and obstructive and lecturing ordinary people when you have no idea what it's like to try and work and make ends meet in the UK. You talk about millions of people. You talk about people who are in poverty. You have no idea what that's like because you live in the rare atmosphere of a university at some woke karate place and you think what you're doing is changing the planet i think what you're doing is pissing people off and i think you could allocate your energies more effectively by going out and picking up picking up litter on a beach thank you can i just um i just want to empathize with you katie but it truly does break my heart to hear about your friend um it really does but i really want you to understand that myself and phoebe are acting out of fear you know, we are terrified that... You shouldn't be, my darlings. You shouldn't be. You have been fed a load of nonsense. You're going to live way past 25, and I hope you live till 100 and have a brilliant, brilliant life. Young people should not be in a place where you're being intimidated by fear. You should be living the best life you can. Jump, 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 and your wings will unfurl on the way down. You're limiting your whole world. We should be living a life... Not standing throwing soup in a gallery. Because it's, it has to be done. We're fighting for our lives here. Oh. The only way we can make the change happen is if we make systematic change. I completely empathise with you, and I want you to understand that this disruption that we are causing will stop immediately as soon as the government releases a meaningful statement that they will stop producing more fossil fuels. It's as easy as that. that you, I understand your anger. I really do. I really understand your frustration. I'm angry and frustrated. I really, really am. And... But all this can stop the minute the government... That's not true because we need more fuel. We need more fuel supply. One of the things about supply and demand, as you'll know, is if supply is restricted, demand remains the same. Prices go up. It's basic economics. We don't have enough fuel supply. Stopping oil is not going to help with pricing. You talk about renewables. They're not there ready to take over from oil. Well, Well, we currently have eight years worth of oil in reserve. So if we stop new oil licenses now, we would still have eight years to make a just and fair transition to becoming a completely renewable society. The biggest solar farm in the UK was built in six weeks. You know, we're an island right now. We could be harnessing tidal power. It current, the tidal power current, currently accounts for 10% of our UK's energy production. I, I, I hear your stats. I hear your stats. But do you see that you're going to need to bring the general population with you and people's opinion with you? And I don't believe you're going to bring any people's opinion with you when you're stood throwing soup at artwork. Well, you know, this isn't a popularity contest. The True. suffragettes were famously hated. Martin Luther King was voted the most hated man in America when he was alive. And the thing is that right now we know that these tactics of nonviolent civil resistance do work. I'm sat here today as a queer person and the reason I'm able to vote, the reason I'm able to go to university, the reason I'm able to hopefully will someday will marry the person I love is because of people who have taken part in these acts of nonviolent civil resistance before me well i'm i'm uh not to cut you guys off i'm actually a food waste activist and the fact that you guys do soup mm-hmm. on the painting really bothered me because i'm pretty sure there was hungry people outside that would have loved to have eaten it so because of that i'm gonna go fill up my gas tank i have to <laughs> i have to i'm just but so listen upset. ladies i it, uh, i gotta tell I you one, uh, did you want to say yeah, something, just something one quick question up. for you um i applaud what you guys are doing 
Um, kudos to you guys for, for at least being very passionate about something. 20 years old, I you know, if you're both 20, I was not half as passionate about anything as you guys are, so respect on that. But there is a famous quote out there that says, when you're young and if you're not liberal, you have no heart. But if you're, as you get older, if you're not a conservative, you have no brain. So you guys are going to figure that out along the way. We all are. So respect to you. Here are my two questions. Legitimately, what pronouns do you identify with? That's number one. Number two, if there's a hundred of your friends in a room and you talk about your top issues that you care about, What's number one, two, and three, meaning climate, LGBT rights, the economy, health care? So pronouns and your issues, if you would. Uh, so I use they, she, he pronouns, whatever you're in the mood for. Um, and for me, I think the climate crisis and also the cost of living crisis are uniquely unifying because this will affect everyone. And your friend? I also go by they, them pronouns. I also don't see how that comes into this argument because the this is what we're facing, this climate crisis goes beyond anything to do with gender or sexuality. But I completely agree with Phoebe. The main concern my friends and I talk about is the climate crisis and the cost of living crisis. My university had to open a food bank for its students this week. That's how dire things are. Students who are already getting a loan by the government to pay for things like this can't even afford to buy food using that loan. Yeah. It's all the energy bills because of the climate crisis. Phoebe, Our biggest Anna, concern is eating against meat and just feeding ourselves. Phoebe, Anna, if you had an outcome that you wanted to get with what you did, you got it. You guys were able to get the attentions of others to present your argument. And I, I applaud you for your emotional control because you were pushed uh, and folks came at you here and uh, you were able to give your argument. Now, whether the audience agrees or not, it is what it is. Whether anybody sits there and agrees with you or not, it is what it is. I applaud you guys to be respectful in return. And I value that. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing your views. Uh, we appreciate you guys. Have a wonderful day, guys. The future looks very bright, by the way, just so you know. I believe the future looks <laughs> very bright. Take care, guys. Bye-bye, bye-bye. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.